This is my 41st video on my work with OO Gauge. See part 1 of this series for my reasons for getting into OO Gauge when I already had a lot invested in working in N-Gauge and I didn't really have space available for a large, fully operational OO Gauge layout. Also, see my lengthy series on my N-Gauge railway modelling for smaller and more complex scenery and smaller scale trains running. This part is the 15th, dealing with my third layout made using mainly Hornby set track. See the prior video, part 27, for my reasons for wanting to try a Hornby set track layout when I already had an OO gauge layout using Backman Easy Track. This part deals with a bunch of small scenic items I had acquired for my Hornby layout in progress. Water towers, water cranes, post boxes, a phone box, a loading gauge, milk churns, lamps. I know I said I'd be doing the Metcalf Goods Shed kit next, and I will be getting to that very shortly, but I had these various small scenic items that I'd picked up, mostly from British model trains in Cambridge, Ontario, with a couple of items from eBay, and I wanted to sort them out, see what I'd got, do assembly and finishing where necessary, and either get them onto the layout or at least set them aside for future use in an orderly way. Here's what I had from British Model Trains. A water crane, a Coleman with coal scales, a Pico round water tower, a couple of different sets of platform gas lamps, some Pico milk churns, a Pico phone box with caller, Scaledale post boxes, some Pico benches and a loading gauge. I took all of these out of their packaging, numerous staples and quite a pile of garbage and recycling. Some of the items didn't really need anything much doing to them to make them ready to use on the layout, but some did require a bit of assembly. The Pico kit for a foam box with a caller was one of the most interesting items. The caller came pre-painted, and very nicely too, I must say. The box needed some assembly, and the instructions said to stick it together using polished cement. But first I removed flash, of which there was quite a bit, using a sharp knife and an emery board to get the parts to the point where they would assemble and didn't have obvious unwanted bits on them. Then I used a fine brush to do a little bit of painting inside the box, just to pick out the body of the telephone and the shelves. With care and some filing, the box could be assembled so that the door could be opened and closed. Though even with the parts smoothed to size as best as I could do, I could only get the door to open this far. It hinges on pins at the top and bottom, and the back of the door is just hitting the side of the box by the time you get it this far open. Still, it's possible to have the door open and see the caller inside looking quite realistic. Actually, from what I remember, in reality keeping the door of one of these boxes open was no easy task, as they had a very strong spring forcing them closed. I did wonder whether to paint the whole box as the shade of red doesn't look quite right, but for now I left it like this. This is the Pico Round Water Tower assembled. This just pushes together and glue isn't required. It's made from some kind of soft, bendy plastic, and I had trouble getting the ladder and the operating cable to stay anywhere close to straight. They came bent in the packaging. I tried to straighten out the bends by running them over a fingernail, but I could never seem to get them to stay really straight. The Pico benches came separate. They didn't really need anything doing to them, although of course they could be painted a different colour. Some of them did tend to fall over as they came, and a bit of filing of the legs was necessary in order to get them to stand up properly. The Pico milk churns just needed to be separated from the sprues that they came on. The four lamps at top left are pre-painted P&D Marsh items and didn't need anything doing to them. These Pico lamps needed a little assembly. The transparent parts fitted over the tops of the posts. That was easily done. Then the small top pieces were supposed to be pressed down above the transparent pieces and to snap fit onto the tops of the posts. That wasn't so easy. The top pieces are very small parts. The posts are made from soft, bendy plastic. Considerable force was required to get the tops to fit over the posts, but it's rather tricky to apply considerable force when pushing a tiny part onto the top of a bendy post. 
I found that I had to grip the post just below the lamp itself between two fingernails of my left hand and then use the right hand to force the top on. I did manage to get them all assembled without breaking anything, and they don't look too bad. I actually used some of these on my Backman layout, but I bought those used and pre-assembled, so I didn't have to deal with the rather fiddly assembly process. I bought this Hornby water tower on eBay UK. It came with a water crane. Unfortunately, the stickers representing the brick facing have been put on abominably badly. I can't imagine how anyone could have made such a mess of a simple task. They must have been put on by a cross-eyed infant in a bad mood or a hopeless drunk. The stickers weren't aligned with the windows and the door openings. They were put on crooked, they were creased, they had bobbles under them. I did what I could to smooth them down and remove the bobbles. I couldn't do much more, as I don't think it would have been possible to remove the stickers without destroying them completely. Fortunately, whoever botched the stickers hadn't attempted to fit the glazing, so that was left for me to do. I cut the glazing pieces apart and fitted them inside the tower using poly cement. These glazing pieces were smaller than those for the similar Hornby signal box that I did recently each being just for a specific window, whereas the signal box pieces did a whole wall at a time. Ridges were formed into the plastic beside the window openings to help guide the placing of the glazing parts. Unfortunately, there was a limit to how much I could make things look lined up, as I could line the glazing parts up with the openings in the plastic, but the surface stickers weren't lined up properly with those openings. This is the water crane that came with this tower, a standard Hornby item made of metal. It always seems to me that the red pieces fitted to these as hoses look silly. So I always replace them, as I've done here with a piece of black heat shrink tubing. The other water crane at right is the one I got from British Model Trains. Its hose is sort of red, but has been toned down to where it looks basically brown, and I don't think it looks too bad, although it's perhaps a little short. The Scaledale pillar boxes are made from resin. I drilled holes in their bases and inserted pieces of piano wire as I found this to be the best way of fixing them on a layout. You could just glue them by their bases, but it's harder to get them level and keep them that way. Here's the brick water tower with its water crane on the layout in the yard area by the turntable. I think it doesn't look too bad from a distance. The loading gauge was a Hornby item, with one of those base clips that is supposed to insert into a groove under the sleepers in the track. In this case I actually used that, I put the gauge just by where the goods shed is going to be, still on the cork base I had installed for the goods shed. I used tweezers and a knife to remove some ballast to allow me to get the clip of the gauge into the slot in the track. I found that I still needed to glue down the back of the gauge base in order to get the gauge to sit level. The phone box with its caller has been placed just outside the station, at least for now. I put the pillar boxes onto street corners. This wasn't as simple on this layout since the baseboard is made from MDF. When you have a phone base it's really easy to stick in the wire on the bottom of an item, but with MDF I had to drill holes, and MDF is not easy to drill, especially using as fine a bit as was required here. I broke one drill bit installing these boxes, but I did get them in place. Here's one just down from the station on the corner beside what will be the railway hotel. And here's the other on the corner by the level crossing at the front of the board. I put the coal scale and the coalman beside the workshop for now. The rest of the items, the lamps and the water tower, I set aside for now because I'm going to put those on the station platforms but I'm still waiting. I'm going to put buildings onto the far platform, and I'm still waiting for a kit to come for that. I ordered the Super Quick Island Platform Buildings Kit, and I'm hoping I'll be able to fit those buildings, although that's not really an island platform. I'm hoping I'm going to be able to fit those buildings onto the middle of that platform. So I want to get that done, and I've also got some more figures coming, station staff and passengers. So I'm going to wait for those uh, things to come before I try and detail the stations. So I put the lamps and things aside for now. So finally for now, here's the recently built Metcalf engine shed, now with two locos in it. 
The tracks are dangerously close to the sides of the doors. It's a pity I didn't get the tracks just a little closer together. Next up will be the build of the Metcalf goods shed, really so this time. I've already started it.